Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heather Goldstone, Chief Communications Officer at Woods Hole Research Center, and welcome to this first KNEB webinar of June 2020. Uh, this webinar series, which we launched uh, back in March as we all transitioned into uh, COVID restricted life uh, working from home. And so uh, I welcome you today from my home as I have for the past uh, few months rather than from Woods Hole Research Center. And we thank you all for joining us uh, for this really special webinar. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, Woods Hole Research Center is an organization of world-class scientists working with a global network of partners to understand and to combat climate change. And some of our partners are other scientists with whom we collaborate around the world in studying some of the world's most consequential ecosystems. Some of our partners though fall well outside uh, the scientific realm. We work with leaders in a variety of sectors uh, to help bring science out of the lab, out of academia, into the real world and into the hands of those able to make the change that we need in order to address the climate crisis. And that is something that you will very much hear about today in this webinar marking the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's uh, encyclical Laudato Si with a discussion of faith-based climate action and how that has grown and evolved over the past five years. Before we get started on that, as we've been doing each week, for those of you who are uh, returning to our webinar series, we'd like to get to know a little bit about each of you. As I've already noted, uh, we understand that these webinars are happening uh, in unprecedented circumstances. And normally, if we were coming together for this kind of discussion, you'd be walking into uh, perhaps an auditorium where you could see those around you. And in this webinar setting, uh, we can't do that. But we would like to get to know a little bit about those of you who are with us um, today. And we have people still streaming in to join us. Um, almost 275 people with us right now. So uh, glad to have you all with us. And what I'm going to do so that we can start to get a sense, just a, a little sense of who else is in the room is I'm going to launch a poll here and ask you each to tell us how old you are. An easy question that we should all know the answer to. Uh, so I've put that poll up and we'll give that a moment or two uh, for everybody or most of you to have a chance to vote. And we're getting there. We're at 65, 70% have uh, given us their answers so far. Uh, slowing down a little bit, we're at about 80%. And so far, uh, the vast majority of our audience today in the over 65 age range, uh, almost 75% about three quarters of people, uh, close to 20% in the 51 to 65 year age range, about 5% uh, in the 30 to 50 age range, and a handful of people under 30. I'm going to end that poll and share those results up on the screen with you just for a moment so you can see those numbers. Um, so of course, uh, that's only uh, one way to, to get to know each other. One of the great things about these webinars is that we are not restricted by geography. So a silver lining in our current circumstances. And that means that we can have both panelists um, from around the country and around the world, and that we can have all of you joining us from around the world. And we have seen people joining us from around the world. So I'm gonna launch another poll here and uh, ask you all to tell us where you're joining from today, where you live. Um, seeing so far uh, mostly in the US Northeast and Canada, US Midwest and uh, the Western parts of the United States uh, coming in about third there, uh, some from the South, but also folks joining us today from Europe, from Central and South America, uh, from Africa. Uh, we'll give this another minute. It looks like the voting has slowed down. Um, but again, I will share these results with you because hearing those numbers as they uh, fly by can be a little uh, tough to take in, but it is great to have such a global audience for our discussion today. Thank you to everyone who is joining us from around the world. So um, as I already mentioned, today's discussion uh, of faith-based science, of faith-based climate action rather, um, 
is uh, inspired by the upcoming fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's uh, encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si, published in June of 2015. And uh, I have to say at that time I was working as a, a science reporter and covering the impact of that document um, within the science community and also within uh, communities, uh, faith communities and climate action communities. And the thing that really struck me out of all of my reporting, uh, the, uh, the encyclical itself was historic in a number of uh, regards, one being, uh, as I was told, that uh, an encyclical had never quoted uh, scientific documents like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change before. So that was a step out of the, the usual. But I also heard from faith leaders, not only in a range of Christian denominations, um, but from a range of faith uh, backgrounds that uh, in a lot of cases, this was the first time they had read an encyclical and that it had really struck a chord with them, that this document struck a chord well outside uh, the Catholic Church. And so it is um, with that initial impact in mind that we turn our focus to what has ensued over the past five years in terms of faith-based climate action and cooperation between the faith and science communities. And uh, I'm gonna hand over the role of moderating today's discussion to my colleague, Dave McGlinchey. He's our Chief of External Affairs uh, at Woods Hole Research Center. He is a man of many talents. Uh, he is a lawyer, he is an author, and I have to share, he also uh, recently uh, gave the sermon at a local church uh, on this very topic on the uh, moral case for climate action. Uh, and so I can tell you that faith-based climate action is uh, something that is near and dear to Dave's heart. And I'm happy to turn it over to him to moderate the rest of today's discussion. Thank you so much, Heather. Can you hear me okay? Sound great. Great. Uh, yes, as Heather said I did uh, deliver the homily at a local church on faith-based climate action. And when I was invited to, I thought it was gonna be a few minutes at the end of the service, but then I found out I had to actually deliver the homily, integ integrate the, um, the reading of the day, and it became much more daunting. But they didn't run me out, so it must've gone okay. Um, thank you, Heather. Uh, thank you for that, that excellent introduction and framing I think the impact and the importance of Laudato Si, it was a remarkable document and the, um, the, uh, it, it's, it's still having impact to this day. And I'm gonna share my slides now. Okay, well, like I said, thank you so much. And uh, thank you uh, to everyone who's attending today. Um, I hope you're all safe and well during this uh, turbulent and difficult time. Um, this is an issue we're talking about today that is near and dear to my heart. I'm very pleased to be a part of the conversation. Uh, this is gonna be a conversation. I'm gonna take, take about five to 10 minutes at the outset to, to frame um, the, the topic and the context, uh, but then I wanna make most of this uh, a dialogue with our two excellent guests. Uh, so first of all, uh, Heather introduced the Woods Hole Research Center. I'll just take one more moment to do that. Uh, we are a scientific research institution founded in 1985 to study climate change and to integrate that research into decision-making and policy-making. Our founder, George Woodwell, was among the first climate scientists to testify to Congress back in 1986. We were deeply involved in launching the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and have been um, intertwined with domestic and international policy-making ever since. Broadly speaking, our scientists study how climate change is affecting the world, how it will affect the world in the future, and how we can manage natural systems like forests, soils, and wetlands to help mitigate climate change. So why is this science-based organization working with faith communities? Uh, and the answer, as Heather described in her introduction, lies in our approach towards impact. We're a small organization. We have about 75 employees. Um, and we're only able to get our science out into the world through partnerships. So here you see a sampling of the partnerships we're involved with. They include national country governments, universities, other nonprofit organizations, and private sector companies. And it was this 
approach to outreach that led to a remarkable meeting in May of 2018 convened by Cardinal Sean Patrick O'Malley of Boston. In this photo, you'll see Woods Hole Research Center President uh, Phil Duffy next to the podium. On the other side of the podium is Cardinal O'Malley. Uh, next to the Cardinal is one of our panelists here today, Reverend Mary Emma White Hammond. Um, and you can really see uh, an array of, of faith leaders um, of all denominations and faiths uh, coming together. And this group came together because they identified a shared uh, moral and ecological emergency. Uh, the day they met, they also released a powerful statement that identified this overlap, it identified uh, the overlap between the scientific community's concern about climate change and the religious community's concern about climate change. I'm gonna read you one brief paragraph from that statement, which I thought sums the whole thing up rather nicely. Motivated by the climate crisis, we come together as people of scientific competence and people of faith because continued inaction is both scientifically irrational and morally indefensible. This meeting led to a coalition with enormous, enormous potential called the Faith Science Alliance. I'm very excited about the impact that this group will have delivering climate science to audiences that are more likely uh, to be receptive and to listen to a faith leader than they are to a climate scientist. But of course, this is just one example of a wide array of environmental and climate change activism by faith leaders. This important work to raise awareness of the moral emergency of climate change stretches across years and decades and countries and faiths. The example of that that prompted our webinar today, as Heather mentioned, was Laudato Si, the second encyclical issued by Pope Francis, published just a little more than five years ago um, this month. And the direct message was startling to many people who didn't expect such blunt environmental language from the Vatican. Um, but as you can see in clear and unequivocal terms, uh, the Pope, Pope Francis identifies the importance of the climate, the importance of a stable climate to the global community. One aspect that surprised many outside observers uh, was the scientific depth of the document. Heather mentioned that it actually cited the international, um, I mean the IPCC assessment reports. Um, and I've pulled language from the Dato C here that focuses on three areas of particular interest to the Woods Hole Research Center. If you're familiar with our work, you'll uh, recognize these themes. Um, the, the document identified emissions from permafrost thaw as a critical important, uh, of critical importance to maintaining a future and stable climate. Um, the enduring importance of tropical forests to sequester carbon and stabilize the climate. And also the multitude of climate risks that we face from unfettered climate change. But fundamentally, this is, uh, this is, this was a moral document. It focuses on the fact that climate change impacts will disproportionately affect developing countries uh, and will disproportionately affect the poorest communities. Those that are least able to adapt, least able to relocate, least able to rebuild. And it correctly notes that sadly, there's still widespread indifference to such suffering, which even now is taking place throughout our world. That was true in 2015, and that is all the more true and all the more urgent in 2020. So we're gonna talk about Laudato Si, we're going to talk about the disproportionate impacts of climate change, we're going to talk about climate justice, and to do that, we have two leaders on these issues. Michael Sean Winters is a journalist who writes for the National Catholic Reporter. He was deeply involved in the organization of the 2018 meeting that I mentioned, hosted by Cardinal O'Malley. His perspectives on issues of climate, justice, and religion are always piercingly insightful. You can find his writing at ncronline.org. That's National Catholic Reporter, ncronline.org. He also asked me to place a link to some relevant writing uh, in the chat se section of this webinar. I'm going to do that in just a moment. Reverend Mariama White Hammond is the founding pastor of New Roots AME Church in Dorchester, Massachusetts. 
She's a fellow with the Green Justice Coalition and was named one of GRIST's 50 Fixers for 2019. She spoke at the Woods Hole Research Center in January of last year in what I can confidently say was one of the most emotional and inspiring talks ever given there. To be fair, most of our talks are by biogeochemists, so it's uh, not the highest bar in the world to clear, but um, it was a remarkable and important conversation. Uh, she also spoke in 2018 at the meeting that um, Cardinal O'Malley hosted, and Michael Sean, when he heard her there, said, I would follow that woman into battle. It would most likely be a metaphorical battle, but it still captures what I think um, is the essence of Reverend Mariama speaking. I've had the pleasure of working with both of them. They're both dedicated and genuine people who are working tirelessly to make the world a better place. I'm deeply honored that they both were able to join us today. So if we can pivot and unmute our, our guests, perfect. Um, Reverend Mariama, I'd love to start with you if you can hear me okay. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Great. So I'm asking this question in the context of the upheaval across America right now. Uh, as a nation, we're struggling with the weight of pervasive and historic and enduring racism. I was hoping you could talk about the connection between climate justice and social justice and how we can start to address some of these inequities and some of these injustices. Yeah, so first I want to thank you for being here. Um, it's good to see my friends at Woods Hole, even if we're kind of seeing each other through the screen. And uh, Michael Shan, it's good to see you. It's been a, a little bit, so it's, um, it's good to be here. Um, I think this question really aligns with the spirit of Laudato Si. And um, what I think was powerful about it, yes, you know, that the Pope talked about science, and but what I think that really deeply resonated with people is that the Pope made a connection between the deep injustice we see in how we treat each other and the deep injustice in how we treat all of the rest of the living um, and present beings in our planet. And um, I think he, it, it's so well articulated, something that many of us who are spiritual leaders, but it's not just spiritual leaders that see um, that we just are not living in right relationship. And that's the bottom line of really all of it. It is only when you have extremely unhealthy relationships that one human can put their knee into the neck of another human and keep it there as their life literally flows away. And that other humans could sit there and watch that happen. If you can do that, if you're a society that produces people that do that, then it's really not hard to understand why we would be so short-sighted in the way we live with all the rest of the creatures on this planet. And so um, I think we are pushing ourselves to the limit at which this planet will tolerate our behavior. I think we like to say we're saving the planet, but I just want to get really clear. The planet will continue to exist. Most of what we're doing, unless we start a nuclear war, which is also unfortunately within our ability to do, um, the majority of the planet will stay intact. Yes, species are dying daily. Um, yes, rivers are being polluted. But I think what we are doing is pushing it to the point where the earth might say, you know what, if it's between you and me, I choose me. And, and that's what we are doing. And I think what was beautiful about the, what Pope Francis articulated is the fact that we are so unhealthy that we're doing that even to our own species. No giraffes don't say, oh my gosh, you have four extra spots. We are gonna like deny you the things you need to live. No other species behaves like us. And so I, what I appreciated is the naming of us as the problem, not the planet, um, not the birds, it's us. And the recognition that, you know, quite frankly, we have tech, not, we have plenty of what we need to get started. It's not a problem. We have solar power, we have wind power. What we lack is the will to change. Um, 
And I think that's what we're seeing in this moment um, where I will say I see some silver lining is that COVID has brought us to such a deep place of vulnerability that those of us, maybe even who usually weren't re inclined to self-reflection. There are some people, as a pastor, I can be truthful. There are some people that really are just somehow beyond self-reflection. There's a small number of them, they exist. Unfortunately, we get to see some of them broadcast on television, but there, most of us have some capacity to look inside ourselves. And this crazy, unsettling, uncomfortable moment is causing us to look inside. And it's not gonna erase all the injustices. But I do see people wanting, hoping, demanding, and hopefully transforming ourselves to be something better because that is what is required of us. And if we don't get it together, the planet will help to get rid of the problematic species that's causing drama for everybody else. Um, but we don't have to push it to that point. We don't, we, we can rise to this moment in some instances, I see us doing it. We've got a lot more work to do. Um, but I think that Laudato Si really made those connections and, and said, we can do this if we choose to. That's, that's powerfully put, and you're absolutely right. Laudato Si identified fossil fuel emissions identified deforestation, identified uh, you know, human activity as the problem. It was unequivocal about that. And that was, I think, surprising and blunt. Um, with that, I wanna turn to Michael Sean uh, and look back. It's been five years since Laudato Si was published. It was clear, it was unequivocal. How far have we come? How far has the church come since then? And where, where does it need to go? Um, you know, when you say the church, I wanna narrow it to start the conversation with the church, the Catholic Church in the United States. And I think people have this misperception that the Pope says jump and every Catholic in the world says, how high, Holy Father. Um, these things are received o o over time. And uh, in America, to give you a sense of how, how, how where, where the learning curve started, uh, the day we knew when Lovato C was coming out, and, and I was part of some conversations about the need to really have a press conference at the National Press Club to explain to, to journalists that, that, you know, what an encyclical is, how it differs from other types of teaching, how this fit into the tradition of Catholic social teaching, which goes back to the 19th century, and then to, to, to the biblical notions of justice and things like this. So we had uh, an archbishop and a cardinal, and they reserved a room that had seating for about a dozen reporters. And it was 7 a.m., and of course, there were 80 reporters. But that idea that whoever was booking the room thought, oh, you know, papal encyclical, climate change, a dozen will be enough. So of course, they had to commandeer additional rooms and live stream it. and. Uh, and after the press conference, one of the participants called me and said, how, how, how did it go? And I said, well, I, I think it might've been a little better if you had actually used the words climate change. So they'd gone for like a half hour and just had it, you know. So, so what, what Pope Francis has done is really introduce uh, not only this, this subject matter, but also the way he, he, he taught in this encyclical was quite different. So I, I, I want to say, I think it's taken the Catholic Church a certain time to, to absorb this teaching. <clears throat> but in the US church, I think there's an additional reason why we have been slow. And, and um, that's because there are really powerful and very well, wealthy interests, some of which are Catholic, that do not want to see a, an agenda of climate change take hold in the Catholic Church. And there are other issues that they want. Um, the, the Catholic uh, University of America, two years ago, three years ago, had their business school, had this big two-day conference honoring um, Charles Koch of the Koch brothers, um, you know, who, who led and funded efforts to uh, cast dispersions on Laudato Si, to question the science. Um, uh, you know, so there, do not understand, the, the, this Pope has faced headwinds on a variety of issues, but really none more than this w within the U.S. church. Um, 
added to that, I, I think there were there were issues with 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 activists learning how to in, engage the Catholic Church, and we can get to that later in the conversation. But I do want to tell you, you know, every year in, in in September, I lead a seminar on Catholic social teaching in Warsaw for the rising generation of, of Eastern uh, uh, Eastern European uh, church leaders. So seminary rectors and um, the directors of Caritas, which would be like Catholic charities and things like that. And every year we have a, a, a session on La Vathosi and they are so eager to learn more about it. And, and uh, the first year we did it, we had this uh, really uh, very charismatic Argentinian priest, Father Zampini, who was working in London, who I'm glad to say, and he just wowed everyone with his presentation. And, and it wasn't just us, the Vatican, you know, hired him like a month later to come be the point person on La Vathosi for the universal church. So, you know, as is often the case, personnel is as important as, as anything. So the Pope has put some really key people in, in good places. I think you have some good things happening. I think you're seeing efforts to get the curriculum of Catholic schools to reflect the teaching of La Vato Si so that, you know, so that children sometimes are the best way to get to the parents, right? You know, so they go home and say, mommy, daddy, why, do, why, why, why is the oil truck here delivering oil in January? So uh, I, I think there's progress, but it, it do, I think it's been slower in the United States than other countries. And I think that's largely because of the, the resistance to this Pope from very conservative, very well-funded uh, libertarian and, and conservative Republican organizations. But before I pivot to another question for um, Mariama, uh, there's one question that just came in. Could you repeat the name of the point person for Laudato Si uh, for the Vatican? Or oh, Father Augusto Zampini, Z-A-M-P-I-N-I. -I. He works um, in Laudato Si, the Holy Father introduces this notion of integral human ecology which is, I think, essentially what, what Mariama was talking about. Like, this all hangs together, and it's about, a, it's about you know, us behaving well, behaving badly, and even more than the moral connections, the spiritual connections, that, that, that the moral has to be built on the spiritual, and if that's not there, it, it's all going to fall apart. So, so he works at, at an office called the Dicastery for Integral Human Development that Pope Francis brought together several different offices. Uh, Cardinal Turkson from Ghana is the... Uh, Cardinal Prefect, uh, and he's the one who hired uh, Augusto, but just a really remarkable guy, and he goes around the world giving presentations to bishops' conferences, to universities, um, and since he's been there, you've seen some new energy and, and excitement. Great. So, Mariama, I was hoping to take a step back from Laudato Si and talk more broadly about faith-based approach towards climate action. You are involved in numerous interfaith initiatives. Uh, you have experience in those. I'm curious as to what you've seen across different faiths as to how this issue is taken on. Um, how widespread is that? How enthusiastic are different religions? Yeah. Um, so I mean, I think it's, it is um, just as, as Michael Sean pointed out, like there are politics within every religious organization. I'm sure that that is, to anybody who actually is part of religious organization, that is no surprise, but probably to nobody. Um, and so, you know, it has, um, there are some spaces where it's taking off more or, um, you know, so th there's a question of what religious leaders are doing and there's the question of where it's permeating down to congregations, right? I'd say where you probably see the best sort of, uh, uh, sort of saturation from my perspective is in the Jewish community, um, you know, which is not to say every synagogue is doing it, but many of the synagogues that I um, know have like a climate committee. So I, I, I'm guessing, you know, I, I don't think anybody's put this out, but per capita, you know, the, the Jewish community is probably where you see some of the strongest level of activity. Um, I've, I've, ar I've already been invited to multiple Sukkot, which is a Jewish holiday um, where you build a structure outside um, and and use all nature-based pieces to do that and you have dinner in your school. And so there, I've seen people, multiple people sort of saying, how do we take rituals that already were there for us and expand them to help us think about um, how we make this a part of our faith? Um, I know great sort of Muslim uh, folks who are working. I know, I see, I think there's less ability to, to um, get all the way down to the congregation. And I think that's in part because particularly in the United States, 
Um, first, I think uh, many Muslim congregations are far more diverse in terms of the number of different folks from different communities that they are catering to and have been very much under attack both their individual members in terms of what's been going on with immigration and other sorts of things and um, you know, sort of the institution as a whole. So I think when you look at where people are, some of that has to do with who um, has more space and are more financially secure and have some more, uh, who have full-time staff, for instance, right? Um, to be able to engage more. But I, I would say there's not any faith community that um, is not, engaged in some way where not where some members are not engaged. For instance, I'm in um, a, a predominantly black denomination, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. We've done some really great work in terms of um, over the last three years, putting out the kind of statements that, you know, that are powerful and that we weren't doing it before. We still have much more work on getting down to the point where you sh show up at any local African Methodist Episcopal Church and people are like, yeah, we have a green team. Th th that's not, that's not across the board. And so we have a lot of work to do because I think that um, what's powerful about faith communities is how deeply rooted we can be in our local communities. And so, um, you know, I think all of our um, religious institutions need to do a, a better job of asking how do we create more opportunities for some bottom up local folks to get in there and get active on this issue. But there are pockets of excellence in every tradition um, while there's still so much room for us, us to keep moving forward. So I'm gonna pivot back to Michael Sean for another question. And then after that, we're going to open it up to audience questions. We've got some um, lining up in the Q&A, which is excellent. Please uh, submit them there. Uh, Michael Sean, you spoke about the, the difference between the global Catholic Church and the U.S. Catholic Church uh, and the obstacles to progress with the U.S. Church. Um, acknowledging those, can you share some success stories? Who's shown leadership? Who's, who's set the path forward in terms of what can be done in the United States? Sure. So, so right in Boston, if, if you are driving on um you know, uh, 95 to 90, I guess it's, it's, it's 128 at that point, just uh, in Braintree, just before it separates and joins 93, going north, um, you will see the chancery, the administrative headquarters of the Archdiocese of Boston. And uh, they put in a, a 1.5 megawatt uh, solar installation, which, you know, is enough to, to, I think, take care of about 100 homes for, um, for a year. And I was having dinner with, with the Cardinal one night after they had put that in. And I said, Oh, how, how did that go? And he said, it's saving me $30,000 a month, <laughs> you know? So, so um, this, this is, you know, I thought, Oh my God, this is going to take off through the archdiocese because especially, you know, with the COVID-19, I think every church is terror. It, it's, it's budget is going to be much harder this year. And here's an area where if you develop the right business plan, there's a, there's a way to, to convert to sustainable energy that there's no money up front for the religious organization. And um, so, so Cardinal O'Malley was able to do that. But in Massachusetts, that SMART program that the, gover that the government uh, set up, um, you know, the money ran out before they, had the, 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 um, uh, 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 before they had the plans in two parishes that wanted to do it. The third parish, there was very much local opposition. The church wanted to do it. But um, so I think part of the... the answer to this and and what is if you look at that chancery um installation that cardinal sean did that was all union labor and if you're having trouble with local officials getting permits or permission from a zoning board your local building trades union they know how to help there and so if you have projects that have labor at the table at the very beginning you've just brought in a very powerful ally uh that's not true in parts of the country uh, and and uh, but I, I think that's 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 wise, and it also helps us address um, an important problem, which is, you know, you go to a state like Pennsylvania or, or Ohio where they have a lot of fracking, and they say, hey, wait, this is giving jobs. You want us to stop this until solar industry is producing good-paying union jobs with benefits. You're gonna have it's gonna be a hard sell for a whole lot of people who who you know have a family to support. Uh, so that was one one uh, good news. Another was um, 
in, in the Archdiocese of Atlanta, and I'll hold it up, uh, this is uh, the Laudato Si Action Plan. Um, this was devised by Archbishop uh, Wilton Gregory, who's now the Archbishop in Washington, who made a little news yesterday uh, for show, showing his displeasure that President, President Trump was coming to a Catholic shrine. Uh, but he, uh, a group of scientists at the University of Georgia reached out to him when he was in, in Atlanta and they developed this um, action plan, which has things families can do, things parishes can do. And that has been used now at the uh, Archdiocese of Boston, New Orleans, San Francisco, uh, Savannah, at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, which was of course Dr. King's church. Um, so that's that's was hard work that put what, that went into that, and and they came up with a I think it's 42 pages that has some tailoring. It's it it gives broad suggestions, but it it if you don't know how to start, you pick that up, and 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 it it points you in the right direction, and then you tailor it from there. Um, and then the other thing I would mention is the California bishops and. And in these links that you're putting up, Dave, uh, there's some reporting on that uh, that we have at, at the National Catholic Reporter. Um, they issued it last year, kind of a localized version of La Vato Si with very particular goals for both uh, church and the wider society, um, uh, aiming at, at things like integrating uh, the teaching of La Vato Si into our liturgy. Uh, they talked about divestment of uh, and, and also investment, like it's, it's not just not in, in investing in divesting it from fossil fuels, but what are you putting your money in? Um, and, and also institutional operations. The Catholic Church has a big plant. We own a lot of real estate. And I think, I, w I wish looking back five years ago, rather than focusing so much on the teaching and the beautiful words, we had actually addressed it as an invitation to convert our physical plant and lead by example. And I, I, I think that's starting <clears throat> but that really should have been a focus the first year. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll admit that didn't dawn on me that first year either. So I'm coming late to the game also. But, you know, there's a lot of Catholic schools. There's a lot of Catholic cemeteries. There, there are things that you can do uh, that will save the church money on its, you know, after salaries, every church utilities is your second biggest budget item. Uh, so I, I think that's something that we've, we, we're seeing some progress on and, and there's room to see more. Yeah, and that's true, I mean, from across many different sectors, making it a practical solution tends to overcome ideological challenges. Um, and one thing you brought up there actually addresses one of the questions we have in our queue. Somebody asked a great question uh, about suggestions on, on how to turn Laudato C into actions in education. Uh, the Archdiocese of Atlanta plan that you cited is a great example of that. So I'm gonna share a link to that in the chat. Um, I'm putting it in right now. Uh, so for, for the person who asked that and anyone else is interested, I've linked to that and I think it's an excellent resource. Um, uh, the next audience question though uh, on our list and the one I want to flag for Reverend Mariama is how do you share your perspective on climate change? How do you, you know, um, how do you talk to people uh, through a faith-based lens who aren't necessarily ready to receive that message? How do you talk to people who are not as up-to-date in the science or perhaps perhaps skeptical about the, um, the, the, the basis of what you're, you're describing? So for me in my faith tradition, I just start from the basic tenets of our faith tradition. I usually say to people, um, well, let's start from Genesis. It says that God spent six days creating the earth. And in those six days, we were the last part of the sixth day. It talks about the sun. It talks about the waters. It talks about all the plants. It talks about all the animals. And at each point, God said it was good. And it doesn't say, humans were so good, screw the rest of it. Like that's not what it says. <laughs> and so if that's where we're supposed to start, then who are we to live our lives as if the things that God says are good are not good and we have the right to treat everything else like crap. Um, and then I talk about how we, um, you know, there is this notion of dominion and this idea that like humans have control, but this, but that notion of dominion and we could, there are multiple ways to attack it, but the way that I mostly do is, is dominion in only the way that God has dominion and God's dominion is so loving when we don't even deserve it. And so we are not reflective. <laughs> of that 
way of being with animals, with plants, with water. We're supposed to be caretakers, not, you know, I come in here and I cut it down and I, you know, throw it here and I do whatever I want to. And so for me, particularly, and in, in with some of my more conservative um, religious, I say, so if that's what God says and we're not doing it, it's sin. So now let's start talking about what we need to do to correct that. Um, and so, um, you know, for me, again, I would say that God wouldn't put it at the very beginning if it wasn't important, <laughs> you know, and let's begin to talk through because there's so many thing in our, things in our text that relate to the natural world. But because we think it's all about us, we like, don't even pay attention to the things. We, you know, the 23rd Psalm, one of people's favorite Bible verses, full of these conversations about nature and our connection and the still waters. But all we can think about is ourselves. And that kind of narcissism is why we can't get ourselves together. And I think lots of us feel like whether we, we may have different analyses as to why human beings and what we should prioritize in terms of what need, human beings need to shift. But I think um, we don't have to look outside of our texts. And I, I quite frankly, I've, I've talked to leaders and I've read in a number of traditions. I don't know of anyone yet that says, you know, there's nothing in my text I can work with. <laughs> there's, there's nothing in our core beliefs. It's all in conflict. And so for me, it's like, let's just start from what we say we believe. And then if we were really living that, would this be the result? Michael Sean, there's a question about divestment, uh, about where the church puts its money. Um, uh, the questioner asks, uh, notes that the Church of England has been vocal about divesting funds from fossil fuel investments. Uh, do you know of any similar movement or interest in the Catholic Church in any geography? Yeah, well, the, the Vatican announced, uh, actually, we broke a story two weeks ago at NCR that the Vatican for some years has, no, has not been invested in fossil fuels. Uh, in fact, they went on to say, though, you know, as much as we would like to pat ourselves on the back, they basically have a really conservative investment strategy. They invest in bonds, and, and, and I think that was it, so, or, or, you know, financial securities. Um, I think there's been some. You know, I think the divestment issue is, um, as long as there's a market for fossil fuels, and, and especially when it's as low as it is now, it's largely symbolic. Now, we're religious folks, so symbols matter. Um, but I, I think the, the investment part of it is actually more interesting, is, is can, you, um, can you get, um, and, and this gets back to what I was talking about the unions before, um, if, if religion, religious organizations go in, and, and, and this is an industry, the solar industry, that labor has had a hard time breaking into, um, and we insist on it, we will not only have a more just economy, but we're going to have a more just, you know, but the, the objective of putting in the solar panels is going to be more just for the environment. <clears throat> I like to uh, say to people at this point, you know, the Green New Deal, uh, there was a lot of skepticism ab about that. And I said, well, we, whether you think we need it uh, environmentally, now after this COVID-19, we need it economically. <laughs> like, I mean, we need to start putting people back to, to work and this is a way to do it. So not just look at it as a kind of negative, we need to get our money out of that, but um, we're at a moment in time where the, the government has to take direct intervention and put people to work. What better way than converting the infrastructure? Imagine, you know, to take another example, if we had had leadership at the federal level after the hurricanes Irma and Maria hit Puerto Rico, devastating that, that poor island, already, you know, sunk in poverty, uh, islands, uh, energy infrastructure, where it is, the electricity is so expensive uh, that when, uh, when the ships come in to, uh, to dock in San Juan Harbor, they have generators on board the ships because they don't want to plug in to the harbor. It's that insane because it's all diesel, which is brought into the island and, and, and um, they refine it on the south side and, and most of the population centers are on the north, north side. You have to go over the mountains. You have a storm all those electric wires go down. It's insane. And what did they do? They rebuilt the system that they had. This is the definition of insanity because there was no federal leadership. So, so there's a bunch of opportunities there um, that, that we have to seize. And that's again, but I think it's it, uh, religions, and this was very much part of the Lato Si message was, 
we need to bring people together to do this. Uh, you know, to, to my mind, you know, a project that has an entrepreneur and labor both working on it, that's a good thing. And, and, and a religious leader and, and civic leaders and local, uh, Mariana was talking about, you know, the roots that a, that a church can have in a community. You bring that to the table, you start putting all this t stuff together and you can start seeing positive change. Mariana, Michael, Sean mentioned the potential for federal leadership. What do you see as the ability of faith-based groups to influence policy development, to mitigate climate change, or support legislation for better climate policy? Well, I have, I have two answers for that. I mean, I think that there are some religious leaders that have an ear at the federal level. Um, I'm not among them, but um, my denominations probably, I mean, we're probably a little um, <clears throat> too dark to be heard. Um, but I think there are some rel religious leaders who I think have an in and they should use that in um, to, to raise this issue. For me, um, I have reached a point that I, um, you know, I just don't believe in hitting my head on a, on a, on a brick wall multiple times. I, I'll try, I'll try to push it down a few times, but I think there's some point where I recognize my limitations. And so I have, I have chosen um, that given who I, I am and what likelihood my voice is to be heard, that the federal level is not a good use of my time right now. I was very much engaged previously, but I think that um, religious leaders who are in red states and religious leaders within denominations that are respected in, um, by the current administration, should do that work. And for those of us who do not exist in that um, reality, there's so, so much work that can be done at our state level. As an example, Massachusetts talks a good game about how blue we are. We have a terrible record on environmental justice. We have a terrible record on how much of the money that we give towards um, clean energy is actually going to low-income communities that need it the most. We're not directing the biggest of our, our clean energy investments to the communities that are struggling the most to pay their electricity bills. That makes actually no sense. So there is much justice work um, to be done at the state level, such that if you are not among the groups that can be heard at the federal level, um, do not despair. Uh, there is still much work to be done. Well, you say you don't want to bang your head against that wall, but uh, I got a text during the opening uh, the opening comments you made from one of our attendees saying, Mary, I'm a white Hammond for president. Um, <laughs> I think we're late in the game for that in terms of, but I'm, I'm on board still. I, <laughs> I know that everybody else was doing it. I should have just, you know, jumped in last time. <laughs> um, Michael Sean, there was a question about the recent uh, Bishop's Roundtable. Uh, and and the, the question focuses on the idea that the U.S. bishops don't seem to have the necessary sense of urgency and impact. Um, and the, I think the questioner was hoping that uh, a, a pro-life community would see this as a pro-life issue. And the question is, if the science doesn't move them, what will? It's, uh, you know, I, 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 there, there's been an attempt to cast this as a pro-life issue. I think it self-evidently is a, a pro-life issue. Um, and, and yet, Again, you can't, you cannot underestimate the degree in, in American culture to which political categories have kind of swamped religious categories. And so, um, and, and, and sadly, I think a lot of bishops either are just terrified of that fight, um, are, are up, agree with what has happened. Um, but, but it was pretty disturbing. It was last, last November at the bishops meeting in November when the president of the conference, Cardinal DiNardo, the, he was going out, he said, well, yeah, no, I don't, I think we all view this as important, but not urgent, um, meaning the environment. Um, so so I, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of consistency um, for, for Catholic Democrats or Catholic Republicans. There's a, you know, everybody's at the cafeteria uh, in the Catholic Church now. And, uh, and that's unfortunate because I think what you saw in Laudato Si was how all these things do hang together from our core commitment to, to the idea uh, of, of the ideas uh, uh, Mariama was talking about, about you know, our, how we relate to creation, but also the idea, core idea of human dignity, that, that you treat other humans with dignity. 
and and so I'm I'm not hopeful it's going to change anytime soon. Uh, there are I think currently 20 open bishoprics out of 170. Um, you know you hope more than half of them will be kind of Pope Francis y type guys. Um, but it the Catholic Church moves very slowly. Anybody who's looking for I wish I I wish I could say snap you know and and it's going to be better. It's not. It's going to be a slow long slog. But but there's progress. Um, there's, you know, we um, at the National Catholic Reporter, we just started a, 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 a section called Earthbeat to really just focus, you know, journalistic attention on this issue of the intersection of religion and, and environmental issues. Uh, because that's a lot of it. A lot of times it, you know, a lot of it, there are people with bad motives, I think, uh, or at least what I would characterize as wrong motives. But there's also people who just don't know and people are busy and you got to get their attention you know, the, our, our church is in the best and the worst sense of the word of bureaucracy. Um, so it, so it's, it moves slowly. You have to convince a lot of people and bring a lot of people on uh, to, to move in the same direction. And that's never easy. On the other hand, once it's happening, it's not just one person who could be gone tomorrow. The, the organization is now moving in that direction. And I think we're incrementally getting there on, on this issue. So I just want to note that we have quite a lineup of questions here and I apologize we won't be able to get to all of them I'm trying to consolidate the ones that I can um, so I just can say I'm gonna put something in the chat that there is something called the green seminaries uh, initiative um, Boston University is doing a lot of work on that I was on the subcommittee working on that it's not enough but there are people moving forward so that's one question then. <laughs> well let, let me let me uh, pull up another question for you then um, I, looping back again to your opening comments, I think, you know, this is putting you on the spot a little bit, but for the people on this call who want to take, who want to do something about the, the intersection of ecological injustice, systemic racism, what, what can people do? What, what would you recommend people do as a first step or a next step? Okay, so I think there's there's a lot of things to do. So one of the things, and if people wanna, um, they can shoot me an email. I, we have the Green Justice Coalition has an equity tool, and one of the reasons we created is that people would say, "Will you sign on to this legislation?" And we'd be like, "Well, how it's gonna impact our people?" And they were like, oh, "We don't know." And we were like, "Okay, so here's a tool that tells you the questions we're gonna ask. Make sure you know the answers to those because we can't decide." And one of those questions is, "How are you working with labor? Does this create good jobs?" So I think that there's um, a, a series of things people could be doing. Um, they start from, if you already are active on, on environmental legislation, what is that legislation doing around equity? If it says nothing about equity, let me let, me let you know. Generally, it's probably not gonna be good for poor people, right? If it says nothing about labor protections, then guess what? It probably won't be good on it. And so how do we take the things that people are already advocating for and make sure they are infused with lots of good, strong justice uh, language. Um, I've been working in, in conversation with AFL-CIO. They've been, they're doing some really good work to bring all the unions together to think through what's good, just transition language. It's not out yet, but I, I can tell you that people at the forefront of the labor movement are working on this right now. They recognize that things have to shift, but that what they don't wanna see is that their people get screwed in the process, right? So how do we make sure that as we shift from where we are to something new, one, that people who are doing okay for themselves don't find themselves struggling. And two, what about if we prioritize people who are struggling so they actually are doing better on the other side of that? Um, and I think that's one, one of the things we could look at right now in COVID, right? There's about to be a bunch of money coming down. I'm part of a coalition of folks who are saying, how do we make sure that the money coming from COVID does three things? One, it actually is good for public health. I don't know. You know, maybe we should make sure that people are not going to get more sick. And I, you know, all of us know it doesn't always get down like that. So public health, key, public health, public safety. But second, how do we look at the most vulnerable people and make sure that the majority of benefits are going to them? Because they're also the, most pe the people most likely to get COVID. And finally, how do we recognize that this shock is just one of many shocks that unfortunately we're in for because we're not doing anything about climate. So how do we make sure that we address COVID in a way that does not exacerbate our climate situation? Um, and one of the things I've said to people all the time, let me tell you, you can make a, a, a squeaky wheel on the local level will get 
the oil, right? If you call your town manager, I bet you not that many people are calling your town manager. If you call the people that are in charge of trash in your town and say, I want to have some conversations about how much trash we're collecting, what are we doing to recycling it? And then another question, where are we shipping our trash? Are we sending it to low income communities so that they can get stuck with our toxic waste? So I just think that there's so many places that we can start asking tough questions. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I believe in the statewide and the federal and the big organizing, but you as an individual, if you can even get four friends, can show up in some of these small town um, city agencies that nobody ever calls and <laughs> start foot holding their feet to the fire and making some pretty serious change. But again, I think you got to ask this hard question, who's getting the benefits and who's getting screwed or the crap, the leftover stuff. And if you ask those questions and you start digging, you will find all sorts of opportunities, not only to shift our environmental relationships, but to have some deep and tough conversations about equity because racism doesn't happen randomly. It is lots of decisions, policy decisions that get made about who we send our trash to, where we allow our pollution to go. And, and when you start asking some tough questions right in your own backyard, you have an opportunity to begin shifting some of those dynamics that have been with us for centuries. Can I, Dave, I just want to say there that also that, so Mariama, I think it was talking to, you know, not uh, to, to climate scientist types, okay? The point I want to make to them is when you go to a religious leader, please don't walk in with all the answers. We, when that first weekend, when we had the meetings with Cardinal O'Malley, and there was a young, he was a 20-something, he got up and he said, you know, if this is not the most important moral issue in your agenda, you're not morally serious. And I'm looking around the room, and there were several people in their 70s there who were very morally serious for whom this was new. And that kind of language is, you know, you're, you're insulting. Don't insult. Walk in. Uh, and be respectful and, 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 and listen to their concerns also. Um, you know, that, that's coalition building is, is done with the ears more than the mouth. No, that's, that's a great point. And I mean, for, for those people who were new to this, that, that's what we need. We need more people to be new to this if we're gonna, if we're gonna solve this. Um, we're, we're coming up on 2.30, so I wanna ask a quick hit question to both of you before we hand this back to Heather to close, close us down. First of all, you both inspire me. I'm, just overjoyed to see your faces and to, to talk to you and um, appreciate everything you do. Very quickly, uh, what, you know, when, when we met in 2018, we had a lot of conversations about sea level rise, how that was gonna impact different areas, different neighborhoods. Uh, what science would be helpful? What climate science uh, would, would either be eye-opening or useful um, to, to faith leaders, you know, in Catholic church or in, in any faith? So I, I, I'll just name a few things that have really touched my heart. Um, I was in a lecture where someone talked about um, the phytoplankton in the ocean that produces a good percentage of the oxygen we breathe. And I always knew that, you know, trees and plants, I was totally unaware. And I think um, science that tells us a story about who we are and tells us about connections we didn't even know we necessarily had can open our hearts up to be more committed to being in solidarity with, in relationship with, fighting for things that we have tended to see as inanimate objects, as that thing over there. And, and I think that's why we are able to treat them um, in, uh, in my opinion, unholy ways. And so I think in as much is you can help us to see the richness, the depth, um, and the life of, of creatures and communities that we disregard. Um, I think it'll be really helpful in activating a whole nother group of people um, who right now feel like it's all about us. I quickly invoke a great Massachusetts native, Tip O'Neill, and say all politics is local. Um, so are all lessons. So I think, you know, as much as it is critical that we try to save what's the Amazon, 
what is might have a better effect changing people's heart is you know a curriculum for high school students that looks at the shoreline of Massachusetts and and says look there are towns we have that that uh, religious sister from Hull who had to evacuate one winter right remember was it Superstorm Sandy and you know I mean that speaks to people because that person sitting next to me had to leave her house at three in the morning. This is, and, and we drive by Hull and we see it, the sign on the way to work. I mean, the local, 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 local. Thank you. Thank you both. Heather, back to you. Thank you, all of you. I'm so glad uh, that we were able to have this conversation today in this particular moment. It was not planned uh, to coincide with what is going on in our country, um, but I think much needed and very appropriate, as Dave said, inspiring. And, um, and as I've seen many people say in the comments, also uh, practical and actionable. So thank you. We've had almost 350 people uh, on this webinar for most of the hour. Thank you to everyone who has joined us. Um, if, as many of you have said, there are aspects of this conversation that you would like to revisit or share with others, please know that it has been recorded and it will be available um, on our website uh, and our YouTube channel by the end of this week. And as you have registered for this webinar, we'll let you know when that recording is available. Uh, thank you again uh, to our panelists. Thank you to our attendees and stay safe and healthy. <laughs>